right, guys, welcome to another episode of the Type 1 Lifting Podcast. I have the creator of Victory, Victory Grips, Victor Pellegrino. How you doing? Good. How are you? Not bad. I, so I, like I said before, um, we were like DMing each other back and forth. And you said that you go to bed at eight o'clock. I was like, holy cow, that's like amazing, first of all. So yeah. what, like, how are you able to go to bed so early, first of all? Uh, I, well... I, my natural chronotype, I'm a, I'm a morning person, always have been. Um, and, you know, growing up as a kid, I was the first one out of, on my block, knocking on friends' doors. My parents would get aggravated at me and tell me to go away. It's too early. <laughs> um, <laughs> I was the first one to, you know, the pass out of all my friends, you know, in, in my teens and in college. And, uh, and then uh, unless we were we were out drinking <laughs> and then, then that's a different story. Yeah. Um, yeah. That was college. Um, and, but my natural, my natural chronotype is a morning person. Um, my son, he's seven. He's a, uh, he is um, a natural morning person as well. Mm -hmm. Like he just naturally will wake up no matter what at around six fifteen, six thirty. 30. Um, and we've learned, we learned real quick for us to get the best night's sleep we can is to go to bed when he goes to bed. Mm -hmm. And so eight o'clock it is, and it just feels natural. Yeah. yeah. So I, I, I go to bed, I go to bed by, you know, eight, eight thirty, and I'm up by four thirty. I'm in my home gym by five. Yeah. That, that's kind of, that's exactly like me. Like I wake up at four twenty, go to the gym, work out. And then my son wakes up at like six thirty every morning too. And granted, like, I wish I can get more sleep, but I typically go to sleep around like 10 o'clock. So I get oh. like six or seven hours of sleep. I know it's not, I know it's not good, but I mean, it's, it's what I got to do, you know? But some people could operate like that. Some yeah. people could totally operate on six hours or so sleep um, fine and be totally fine. I think like Jocko Willink, mm -hmm. you know, he's one of those types of characters, but I am not, if I get anything like seven hours is pushing it. I need like eight or nine. And there is something that's very like that difference between seven hours and eight hours for me is like huge. big. It's huge. Um, but yeah, like my optimum is nine hours. If I could just the days I sleep like nine hours, I feel like a rock star. Yeah. You, usually for me on weekends, I'll sleep to like 830 because like my son wakes up at like sit like your son wakes up at like 6 15, 6 o'clock. He'll go downstairs in the basement, play like Mario Kart on the Wii or get on his tablet in his room and just kind of like just sit there just chill out and then you know I'll wake up I'll, I'll get back home and I'm like all right let's get ready for school and stuff like that so I mean he's my daughter is exactly like my wife she'll like sleep till like super late and doesn't care she gets you know she wants to sleep as much as possible yeah 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 my wife gets a lot of sleep that's why no matter how healthy or what I do health and nutrition wise I think she's gonna outlive me <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So do you have any other kids at all or, or just one? Oh, we are one and done, man. We, we, we had, we had our son. Um, I think it's later in life. We were both, my wife and I were both, uh, in our forties, early forties. And, uh, so, you know, we had a, they treated her like a dinosaur despite being advanced maternal age. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, so we had a blessed with a perfect pregnancy and, uh, he came out great so we're like we're done <laughs> and yeah, that's about I, it i hear you like that was when we were talking about having another one i was like i'm cool with i'm cool with one so i was like 30 <laughs> 37 38 and i'm like oh uh, because having the first one i was like really nervous of you know having having one kid general first of all like this is like a whole new change in life and not like i don't know what to expect and so having a second one and i'm glad i'm glad i did like don't don't get it twisted that like i don't want i didn't want the second one but you know, I'm glad we've had both of them, but it's just like, man, having two by yourself sometimes it's like, holy smokes, even three. Like, I can't imagine people have like three or four kids. Yeah, I think, you know, I think there's a big, I mean, I think it really is doubling, um, you know, the workload at two. And I think from my friends, talking to my friends that have like four kids, they're like, after three it's like whatever, you know, they kind of, and everybody ends up taking care of them, you know, it's, it becomes this little village and every, you know, everybody pitches and helps each other, but I'm not that, I'm not, I'm not in that uh, disposition. Yeah. We're great with one. I love being a father. It's uh it's a challenge. It's fun. It's fulfilling, but I'm good with one. 
Yeah. So does your does your son go into the gym with you to work out with you sometimes? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's funny. Yeah, yeah. His name is Banks. Um, so Banks will uh he'll come down and he get you know the little small little uh fair band, little rubber bands. Yep. Um he puts that on his head like a headband and <laughs> <laughs> he, he takes off his shirt and he grunts, and I'm like, Are you do I really do all that? <laughs> you know? So but we recently bought an assault runner, um, and ma- we mainly bought it for him mm-hmm. um, because we were at Power Monkey Camp, and and he just jumped on the assault runners and had a good old time. And so we recently bought an assault runner, and he gets on there and he'll do he'll do intervals, comes up with his own workouts. It's pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's fun. I hear you. Yeah, when we when I when I'm in a basement that like with our home gym, pretty much in our basement. Now we like finished it. We would do a thing called next station. So we do like 30 minutes of work, 10 not that 30 minutes, 30 seconds of work, then 10 seconds to figure out like where the next station is, and then you know, do it again. And we'll do it for a couple of rounds and stuff. And so he uses my old lacrosse sticks as like the the barbell to do like Olympic lifts. He has a three pound kettlebell. And he'll do like the kettlebell and we had an elliptical too. So he would get on the elliptical and just kind of cruise on it. And he, he loved yeah. it. So it, it's so cool just seeing, seeing them interested in what you're interested in. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm big on not pushing him and trying yeah. to, you know, you know, you should do what I do or do the things that I think you should do. Kind of, it's kind of like that dance of like, all right, if you're interested, I'll guide you and I'll help you. I'm not going to push you doing it. Um, but I'm glad he, I'm glad he takes to, uh, to, it seems like he takes to fitness more than he does to sport. Yeah. Uh, which, you know, it, it kind of takes after me in that aspect. I kind of liked, I've been, I was a gymnast growing up and played sports, various sports, but I always liked training more than I actually liked the, um, the competition part of it. I was yeah. always big conditioning. Yeah. So you, you talked about you being a gymnast. So how did you get even involved with that when you were a young kid? Yeah, I started late. I started late. I started at 12 and I had to beg my parents for over a year to, to let me go into it. My dad was always into traditional sports, especially baseball. Mm. I played baseball for like nine seasons and for my dad. <laughs> and my dad was a coach. He just loved baseball. He just yeah. like, that was, his, that was his thing. So um, I indulged him in, in that sport. Um, and then I saw when I I was, um, I saw the 84 Olympics and that's when, um, that's when it was in LA and team USA, the guys took the gold. Um, of course, Russia was, um, that was back in the cold war. So Russia boycotted the Olympics then. So that's probably had a chance that say in why the USA won gold. Um, but nonetheless, I like, I watched, I watched the men's gymnastics and I was absolutely hooked. Um, I was, hooked by what they could do, the strength, the, um, the, the various acrobatic moves, um, the physique that came with it. Um, I was like, dang, I want to, I want to do that. Um, Mm -hmm. so begged my parents, they finally let me get into it and just went full bore into it. It's kind of my personality. It's hard for me to, I'm an all or nothing type of person and I'm Mm -hmm. getting better at not being an all or nothing person. Um, but, but yeah, and then I, I got into that and, uh, um, got pretty good for, um, for how late I got into it and, and the time frame, just because I was just tenacious about training. Um, I would train, I had a pommel horse in my gym. I had, um, uh, rings and in, in my, well, in my garage rather. And I would just train whenever I had a chance. Um, and then. And then I realized I wasn't going to go to the Olympics. <laughs> you, you know, it was kind of like next level. It's like once I turned 16, I was like, all right, I either go really hard and I go and get into a college program mm-hmm. or I kind of with shift gears. And I did, I shifted gears and that what led me into actually uh, performing um, okay. acrobat. Yeah, very cool. Now, I, I did look at your LinkedIn. I know you haven't been on it in a while, but you, it says that you were in the Marines for a little while. So um, I'm, I'm a fellow veteran, too, as well. I'm in the, I, was in the Air, I was in the Air Force. Um, what, what made you decide to go into the Marines compared to, like, all of the other branches? 
because I'm not as naturally smart as you. <laughs> you, you know, if I'm thinking back, thinking back, I was like, dang, I should have either gone Air Force or I should have gone Coast Guard. Mm -hmm. um, it, you know, I just think Coast Guard would have been like, now we're looking back on it. You're on the water, you're on coast, they got cool stations and you're always doing something fun. Mm -hmm. You know, you're, always, you know, you're, you're actually, you, you know, in it, and it's not necessarily, you know, you're not necessarily always getting shot at doing something fun. Um, but, but I, um, in my, my second year of college, I was actually, I got into college doing cheerleading and competitive cheerleading. And I was in Miami at the time at Florida International University. Okay. And I was kind of, um, it was something that was always in the back of my mind. And it's like, I really wanted to do, um, do the Marines, you know, my, um, so my grandfather, um, I'm half Italian, hence the name Pellegrino. He was a World War II vet. He was a scout, um, first generation Italian American. Um, and he had great stories, mm -hmm. a lot of stories he didn't talk about. Yeah. Um, and uh, he, and he served under Patton, and God forbid you speak the name Patton in our household with him around, he'd go nuts because he got <laughs> frosted marching yeah. through Germany because of Patton. And, but anyway, it was just something I always I always was intrigued and admired the military. I loved war movies. I liked I liked everything about it, the discipline, the challenge, the stories, the uniforms, not to mention the uniforms. I always think the Marines still think they have the best uniforms, I think. I agree. Um, yeah. So I was like, I'm, I'm at a point with, with college is like, I need some personal discipline. I felt like I was just not focused. And, and I was, it was at the time was right. And I was like, screw it. I'm going to recruiter and I'm signing up and I signed up for the delayed entry program, finished out my the semester that I was in and then shipped off to, uh, to Paris Island. Um, and I was in, I was in the reserves. I was in the reserves. Um, and I should have gone officer, but I always wanted those things. It's like, I wanted to earn this. I literally wanted to earn the stripes first. And I, yeah. and, and say okay I was reserves and then I could have or enlisted and then I could have gone officer if that's where life took me um so yeah I was in the reserves um I was a field radio operator I served with the um fourth uh um air naval gun liaison down in West Palm they basically called an airstrikes um and then I transferred when I wanted to go back to college I transferred up to eighth tanks up in uh, Tallahassee where I went to school at Florida State Mm -hmm. Um, and, and I actually had an injury to my wrist and I, <laughs> and, the, and the, and the, and, uh, and it was actually during the Marines. It was just like some doing something I forget, but it was probably something stupid. Um, and, and my wrist kept on getting swollen and the, and I went to a doctor and he just so happened to be an army doctor. And he's like, if you want, you could get out because of this. And I'm like, all right, I did what I wanted to do. Um, and so I got out. And then I wanted to cheer, uh, be a, I wanted to be on the field for Division One football. So I ended up joining the cheerleading squad. Get to use my acrobatics. Get to be and uh, travel with the football team, and got back into performing that way. Very cool. Yeah. So you know, it's funny you were talking about your military story. It's kind of like mine too. Like I joined the reserves. I was super late doing it. I actually signed up when I was 27. Into oh, wow. the Air Force. So I was like a year off from like not being being able to be enlisted and I had two degrees at the time and I was like I'll just go enlisted because I just feel like it's a better avenue instead of like you know because if I if I went into the reserves as an officer I'd probably be like working at a desk doing paperwork all day and I was like I don't want to do that I'd rather be in the medical side and so they I became a medical tech and so pretty much I you know I learned so much just being a medical tech instead of just being so, like sitting at a desk like pushing papers pretty much yeah yeah and, and so yeah, I I, and I thought about going back in. Um, I actually I went to uh, I went to law school for a year, um, and I think I was doing that for my dad. He was a lawyer. I freaking hated it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was like, "What the hell am I doing?" But I went into law school, and I was like, "Man, if and and I was going to study entertainment law, but then I was like." If I'm going to really do this and enjoy it, I have to have a higher purpose. 
Mm -hmm. So I started talking to the Marines again. Um, I had a officer recruiter. I was going to go since I was already in, um, in law school, I was going to go through the JAG. Um, I was, my plan was to do, um, you know, do my time as a lawyer in the mm -hmm. military and then maybe switch MOSs or whatever. Um, but <laughs> as life would have it, um, I got a call from a buddy of mine who is a, he's a well, was a, is a well-known director in the theater um, industry. And he offered me a contract for a year to play Spider-Man in London. Um, so I was like, yeah, I'm out, man. <laughs> <laughs> and it's kind of like how my, my life goes. It's like, I, like, I, 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 it's like a playground to me. Like I, I want to dabble into things, like go into things really hard. The wind shifts or things take me in a different path. And it's just kind of like this winding road of, uh, creativity and storylines. And it's, it's pretty fun. Yeah. And it, so it's so some of the uh, some of the shows that actually I wrote down. So you did Beauty and the Beast. I did Beauty and the Beast. Yes, you did. Jeremy. You did Spider Man. You said you've done the Indiana Jones down at uh, MGM in Florida, yep. and then you also did Terminator Two and uh, Terminator Three D. Terminator Two Three D. Yep, and uh, at Universal. So I worked at both parks. I worked at Disney, Disney MGM Studios, and then uh, Universal theme parks back in the early two thousand or yeah, early two thousands. Okay. Wow. How, how, what was that like whole scene like? It was fun. I, you know, and I don't know what's on there. I also trained, um, I also did uh, Don't Stop the Carnival. So I, um, Don't Stop the Carnival was, it was a, originally a book by Herman Woke. Um, and Jimmy Buffett was a big fan of Herman in that book. Mm -hmm. And then so he brought that, he brought that story to the stage. Um, and, uh, I was always a big Jimmy Buffett fan growing up. It's kind of like our family's beach, beach music growing up in Florida. Um, and that same director, um, he's like, I'm actually directing the show. I know you're a big Buffett fan. Do you want an audition? I'm like, yes, I want an audition. <laughs> uh, and so, um, you know, lo and behold, I made that, I got to work with Jimmy for a whole, uh, you know, for a whole summer had my first uh, martini um, with Jimmy Buffett. And that was just a blast. That was just, it was absolutely amazing yeah, um, to, to perform with him. Um, but uh, but yeah, the, doing the whole theater world, that's a different world, you know? And I was, and, and it, was, it was different from the perspective that I wasn't your typical cast member. Mm -hmm. You know, I was a gymnast and in a gym rat. I've always been, like my first job was in a gym at 15 years old mm -hmm. um, and have worked in the fitness industry one way or another throughout all this stuff. It always came back to the gym and I was always a part of a gym one way or another working, training or being a trainer, training myself. Um, so I was kind of like this jock amongst these theater people, yeah. which was interesting, very <laughs> interesting. Yeah. Um, <laughs> a minority in many, in many different aspects, but a lot of fun. I just absolutely love that, the, you know, the, the people that I performed with and we, you know, some of the best memories and friendships that I made and got to travel. So it was, it was a lot of fun. And I get a, I get a kick out of being on stage. It just, I, I feel like I'm a relatively shy person for the most part. Um, but I get on stage and I, and it just, it's a different world. It's just yeah. so much fun. Very cool. And then one thing I saw also, uh, you, you re, so I think it said on said on your profile you did you actually did the closing ceremonies for the Barcelona Olympics. So what what were you doing and like what was that whole scene like? Obviously, the closing part of the Olympics is like this big, huge extravaganza. Yeah, and, you know, just seeing all that. Like, what was your experience with that? Yeah. So, um, so again, I, you know, I was the and that kind of started the whole um, entertainment kind of mini career. Mm -hmm. um, I was again in down in Miami, 18 years old. I was a cheerleader, like I said, with the FIU, um, Florida International. Um, and then the Atlanta Committee for the Olympic Games um, had this big open audition. They had various auditions throughout the country. And this particular audition was in Atlanta. And, 50, and they were hiring 52 um, dancers and gymnasts. Um, combined um, to 
to do the closing ceremonies and the whole thing, the whole show or segment of the closing ceremonies was welcoming the world to Atlanta for the 96 Olympics. Oh, okay. All right, cool. Um, <laughs> so, so we, uh, so me and three are, uh, yeah, three other friends, two other guys that were Cuban and my buddies, uh, one of my buddies' girlfriend, um, we all traveled up. We're like, screw it, road trip, let's go. Um, <laughs> and we auditioned, didn't know what the hell we were doing, trying to learn all these dance moves. And the director was like, listen, just do your best. And this director was the friend of mine. His name is David Bell. Um, was the, he's the guy that I became friends with who ended up hiring me for all these yeah. things. Okay. And so he, he's like, just hang in there. Just hang in there. Try to get the moves. Do what you can. You're welcome to stay and keep on trying, but we know you're gymnasts and, and do your thing. Um, so we tried. We, we showed them what we, you know, he, they knew what he, we showed them what we could do gymnastics and acrobatic and stunt wise. Um, but we stayed all day and still didn't get all the dances. Mm -hmm. But he liked our tenacity, he liked our attitude. And they picked up me and my two other buddies, not the girl, but just my two other buddies, because he liked the package of, you know, this international feel of this, like, little blonde white kid and these two Cuban guys. And, um, and so they hired us, they flew me up early to choreograph some of the acrobatic sequences mm -hmm. um, in the show. And that was three weeks, we did two weeks in Atlanta, a week in Spain blast such a freaking blast 18 years old just full of testosterone and stupidity and around <laughs> all these beautiful dancers and i was like this is it <laughs> <laughs> this is the life um uh, and uh, but yeah that was a blast and then actually performing being at the olympics and then walking out on that stage and just being a part of that whole experience is next level absolutely next level it was we were down we were in the in the olympic stadium and the olympics ended with the marathon runners running through the stadium and doing their last um i i think it was their last actually it was either a last 800 or 400 meters mm -hmm. and i was in i was literally watching them in like the pit watching them zip by um and collapsing at the finish line and and then 10 minutes after that, all that, I was on stage um, in front of the whole world. And, I, and I'm, that was that was an amazing experience that I always always will remember. Yeah, very cool. So what, what made you stop becoming uh, like a stunt coordinator or getting in like, you know, still being in like the theater world? Yeah, I wouldn't say I was a stunt coordinator. I was just a, kind of like the stunt actor, acrobat kind of thing. Um, a stunt coordinator is a totally different, like, yeah. they're, they're actually putting together the stunts. Um, so I hurt my back um, in uh, 2001. I had a spondylus thesis. So basically, the spine comes loose out of place, um, and mine was characterized also by a part what's called a pars fracture, is a little fracture inside the uh, vertebral body in the vertebrae. Um, and so, it, I, it this was during the Indiana Jones time, um, and it. It, it's a common ailment amongst gymnasts and it was hurting, you, you know, it was hurting, you know, on my days off or when I was cold, um, we were tumbling a lot on, you know, doing six shows a day. And I think that just kind of aggravated over time amongst everything that I did. Um, and it started hurting inside the show. And so the doctor, um, all right. And I was like, I got to go to a doctor. And then they, you know, upon analysis, they're like, man, you are close to being paralyzed. Whoa. Um, so they're you know, like, they're like, they're, they said, you're lucky to be in shape. You're, you have a lot of, uh, uh musculature that's holding everything together, but we got to go in and fuse it. And we recommend you stop performing. Mm -hmm. So, um, that's the course I took. Um, my undergrad is related to the exercise sciences. And, um, so no pun intended, fell back on my college degree. And again, falling back to what I call base is fitness mm -hmm. and started uh, my my career as a personal trainer. Yeah, very cool. And so um, later on, like towards you went to, you know, um, you went to SCAD as a grad school student. So um, as was it as a project manager kind of deal? Yeah, design management. Oh, yeah, design, I'm sorry. 
Yeah. So I've been, a, I've always been a nat, uh, like a, just a tinker. I just like creativity to me is like one of the, to me as part of my identity, mm-hmm. um, just coming up with ideas, thinking of new things, playing with different designs, um, new, whether it be new exercises or new pieces of equipment. And, and uh, that's why I liked training people a lot because it, to me, it was a cool little playground. I could come up with a certain exercise, test it, see how the body reacted to it. See, and uh, so it was, it was fun. So I had a desire to create um, uh, fitness equipment. And I was like, you know, I, let me do something different. And um, I was kind of just kind of searching what I wanted to do. And um, so I got in, I ended up getting in SCAD, um, just displayed some of the things I was just kind of playing with. I didn't necessarily have a portfolio, but I showed um, one of the, one of the uh, directors, you know, stuff I was working on. And he's like, yeah, you, can, you know, you, you're just, he, he, he's like, yeah, there's something there with, that we could develop and, and it ended up in design management and design management. It's not, it's a little different from, it's, it's a lot different from industrial design. Um, what it's, what it's doing is basically you're overseeing design projects. Mm-hmm. You're, and you're doing a lot of design research. It taught me how to research. It was design school at SCAD um, was, you, you know, it, it made me re- it made me learn a lot about myself because it made me realize how i how i think and what is the best environment for me to learn in and design school was it very and it very it was very non traditional and very different from your typical academic setting um, a lot of you know doing by playing research observation and it just felt so natural to me mm-hmm. um, and and it was kind of from there that kind of sparked the, uh, it was the catalyst really for what Victory Grips was, was to eventually become because it laid the foundation of how I approach, how I approach ideas, mm-hmm. how I approach research, um, and even how I approach life. You know, it comes down to um, just one, just being a silent observer and just observe first, ask a ton of questions immerse yourself and and just kind of figure things out um and that's exactly what i did to end up eventually creating the grip company very cool very cool and then uh later on you actually um started a you actually owned a box crossfit identity yeah so obviously like you've there's like different avenues you've gone to so what made you i mean i know when did you get involved in crossfit and when did you decide like hey you know maybe i should just own my own gym yeah, I got so I graduated SCAD in two thousand nine. Um, went to went to uh, SCAD Savannah because there's an Atlanta campus and the Savannah campus. So went to SCAD Savannah, um, and then ended up getting a job with a startup company, um, kind of out by where you live. Um, and uh, that was a good experience because it taught me everything not to do in business. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so. I, you know, I went, so I started with that company and, um, that was just not going well. Um, so I, again, went back to base, got a job at, um, at a, at a gym that I had, I had a job at before in Atlanta and, um, started personal training and doing group fitness instruction. I taught, I I mean, I pretty much taught every damn group fitness thing you could probably think of. Mm -hmm. You know, from step aerobics to spinning to high impact aerobics to body pump, um, and then of course personal training. Um, that's just kind of what you did as a fitness person growing up. You know, growing up in fitness in the '90s. Yeah. And uh, and so got a job again with the with the um, with with that Athletic Club Northeast, and there was a guy named Keith Walker who was a fellow trainer and. Um, he was about 10 years older than me, fit as hell. And he's like, have you heard of CrossFit? And I'm like, no. <laughs> <laughs> and this is in 2009. This is in 2009. So, you know, I would say it's kind of like where CrossFit definitely was not hitting critical mass. It was just kind of really gaining speed as it progressed from California. Um, and he's like, well, 
let's do a workout. And he, he said, and, he, and so he gave me a uh, Nate, um, <laughs> uh, the, uh, the whole 20, you know, with the, with the uh, ring muscle ups and yep. handstand pushups, cowbell swings. And that was kind of like, like, that was just like, like giving me crack <laughs> because I'm like, all right. So it's super intense. I got to do gym, you know, gymnastics work. And, he, and he's like, here's, he goes, you're going to have to do a muscle up. And he, he goes, here's what a muscle up is. So I was like, oh yeah, it's a muscle up, you know? And there, and he showed me kipping muscle up and I'm like, but muscle ups aren't kipping. <laughs> yeah. So I'm like, this is a muscle up. And he goes, and he's like, yes, that's a muscle up. So like in gymnastics, because the muscle up, a ring muscle up is not even on the code of points. It is just a way to get from point A, which is hanging um, below the rings, to point B up to a support position. So you could actually start a skill that is on the uh, on the code of points. So, so I so I did Nate, and I was like, "Holy shit, I'm going to the games!" And then, <laughs> and then he's like, then he put a barbell in my hands, and I'm like, "I'm not going to the games." <laughs> Yeah, so that was, you know, it, it was really cool because, you know, being in fitness all my life, being a gymnast, and then introduced to this methodology that was just so um, intriguing from a physiological um, and biomechanical point of view, because of all the different aspects, it was like, all of a sudden, there was things that I got to learn again, mm -hmm. I got to be a beginner. Um, and I love being a beginner. Yeah. Um, and, and so learning how to do Olympic lifting, trying to build my engine, because as a gymnast, we, we don't have any, we don't have an engine when you're a gymnast. I mean, you run 72 feet to a vault and you do like a floor routine and that's it. It's very anaerobic. Mm -hmm. Um, and I had no engine whatsoever. Um, but I absolutely love the intensity. I loved what everybody loves about it, the intensity, the camaraderie, the, the, it gave me an opportunity to compete again. Mm -hmm. Um, and that, that was just a blast. And so it was a, just a, like, I think it is a natural progression for any fitness person to end up going into CrossFit if they didn't discover CrossFit first. Mm -hmm. I just wish, I mean, I was 36 years old and I, w I wish I discovered it a lot earlier. Yeah, um, I, I agree. Same, same with me too. Yeah. So, but you know, I got into it, but I feel is still kind of early, you know, in the cross big scheme of CrossFit and where it has become today. And so we started a, um, an, a we started an affiliate in the Globo gym we were in. There was an old like night. It was a, a this athletic club had a bunch of racquetball courts because it was built in the '80s when racquetball court when racquetball was huge. The jam, the yeah. Thing. So we took over a rap, racquetball court, converted it into a box. It was a true box in the whole sense of the word. And we started getting people hand over fist. You know, we started recruiting our own clients. We started like kind of training them in that methodology. Mm -hmm. And then it eventually said, okay, you are doing CrossFit. This is how you're being trained. We're starting to do group training. Started getting people like more and more people coming in and it just exploded. We took over a second rack of ball court a third and a fourth and then the gym was like they started putting stipulations on us because we were making so much we were making the gym a lot of money yeah yep. and then, so we're like we got to get out of here and so we ended up um getting out um of the gym um finding a space down in the uh virginia highlands emory area of atlanta we um it was more towards emory and um, started, uh, started CrossFit identity and well, it started out for actually it was CrossFit Northeast Atlanta, or it was a big old long name and we changed it to CrossFit identity. And, uh, so, and it still exists today. So, um, started that affiliate eventually my buddy, Keith, Keith Walker, he wanted to get out of the business, um, and, and do something else. I bought him out. Um, and then started running it and, uh, and then I, that's when I came up with the concept of the grips. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and, uh, and then the rest is history. Yeah. So speaking of victory grips, so like, what do you remember? Like when the first 
idea like popped in your head while like working at the box? No, it, you know, ironically, <laughs> it, it actually, it was not working at the box. It was just being around the box. But it, like, so in Atlanta during that time, my buddy from grad school, um, he was a he was a master's of furniture um, student at the time, and we shared the same building. It was in the same um, uh, building at SCAD that both degrees were in. There were several several disciplines. It was industrial design, furniture design, design management all in what was called the golf stream building at, um, in at SCAD. Okay. And um, so he moved to Atlanta, he got a job in Atlanta and we were, you know, poor post-grads and, and all that. And, you know, even though I had the gym, you know, it was still, you know, dealing with student loans and all that. Yeah. So we, you know, we would just hang out at our house at our back deck in Atlanta and drink bourbon and come up with ideas yeah. and you know it's just kind of you get the you know the bourbon kind of gets the creative juices going we would just have a blast playing music talking about ideas and then that's when the, the concept came up and it was just like tunnel vision and and i would literally i went the next day i went to home depot got a bunch of different garden gloves and started cutting them up in different designs because my whole thing was that i wanted I wanted the grips to, to feel and function like actual gymnastics grips do for the sport. Yeah. The gymnastics. But they needed to be redesigned um, specifically for, to, so that they work seamlessly within any given workout situation. Um, and so that's where the, kind of the, you know, the, the uniqueness come, comes from. Um, okay. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. So do you still have like the first rendition of those gloves? I do. I wish I had them like right beside, um, I mean, I don't throw anything away. Like when, and it com when it comes to that, um, you know, I keep all my various, my various prototypes and I'm constantly prototyping. It's just not like I just did a design back then and it took off and it, that's what it is. It's constantly changing. It's this evolution. Like to me, it's just this, it's like an ongoing project. It's a creative outlet. Um, and it just, uh, and it's fun. So I just want to constantly improve it. It's my sport now. It is yeah. my way of, I don't compete CrossFit anymore. Um, I'm more focused on, you know, health and longevity, but when it comes to the grips, it's my way of competing. So it helps me get, helps me allow athletes to be better and perform better um but it's also my way of working on weaknesses as it pertains to the sport i'm constantly looking at the way the grips could be more comfortable perform better um different materials so it's this ongoing project and i yeah i keep absolutely every little scrap of material and idea just so i like i take them out every now and then and stare at them and be like okay what am i missing what am yeah. i like, not seeing today I, I can imagine what your garage looks like well actually you know now it's just a full-on gym like the garage we actually like i used to make do everything i used to cut the grips sew the grips everything 100 percent everything we ended up running the company out of the gym out of our garage um mm -hmm. and eventually it's evolved now you know we we've we've outgrown that i actually now my garage is just my my um gym yeah it's a full on, it's a full on gym um and it's kind of like my lab um so but now we got it we're we just we we're getting a big commercial space um in in savannah um we outgrew this once we outgrew our garage we went into this smaller space we're busting at the seams so we got a new commercial space where i'm going to have a creative um a creative lab in there and then we're also starting an affiliate um, um in savannah so it's all oh, coming cool. very cool very cool so did you have like other people like test it out or is it just mainly like you testing it out no you know it's like you can't work in a vacuum um and and that's been part of a big part of the testing and the evolution of the design is getting them into the hands of the people that use them and that's still constant to this day so when i was formulating the concept and i had the gym my members were my my you know yeah. 
And I would just literally, like I was measuring people's hands and they were like, they got, got at the first they thought it was weird, but after a while they're like, oh, Vic is just doing his thing because I would literally, I'm like <laughs> measuring, measuring lengths of fingers and widths of hands and circumferences and, um, you know, doing, you know, just studying everything, observing people, looking at their hands, look at how they rotate over a bar, what they do with grips and mid-workout asking people it's like why did you do that like in with the grips and they're like oh I didn't even realize it and I'm like and so um and then giving them to people and once people um like started they're like hey these are actually pretty good I'll start can I buy them from you and so it just started to where I would just sell them to them at cost so I could just cover costs yeah yeah um and then it then eventually I was able to have something that went to market but today whenever I come up with a new concept um, I'm always reaching out to customers like they're different customers may have different issues with our grips, mm -hmm. whether, you know, whether it be body, body mechanics wise, size wise, you know, various different factors. Some people go through grips faster than others for one reason or another. And I bring in, I bring in customers and athletes of all abilities and the games athletes, they're easy because they're like, their body mechanics are super good. They're very efficient. Yeah and they 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 make grips last but it's your ordinary gym member you know no matter what the size it could be a dainty little you know a buck 25 woman to uh you know a 250 pound you know former football player you know who's doing muscle ups yeah um, so i get the gamut and actually i'm in the middle of testing or about to start testing something that's extremely important um, and so I got about a hundred athletes slated hundred, uh, hundred CrossFitters slated for that test. Okay. Very cool. Very cool. So how many prototypes did you take? I, I, I think, I, I think I read it. Was it, it said you had 20 prototypes before you like made the finishing product? Yeah, the easily, easily. It was over the course of like three, three years or so. And a lot of it was like, it wasn't like constant three years, mm -hmm. kind of coming in and out of focus. Like if you study different and and I always thought like, God, man, I'm slacking. Why am I not like focusing? But that's, if you look at various different artists throughout time, it's that in and out of focus that, in, um, that yeah. how creativity happens, you mm -hmm. know, not to compare myself to Da Vinci, but Da Vinci, that was like, a, a, like he would come up to a painting like the Mona Lisa and just do a stroke and then walk away and not touch it for months. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so it was like this touch and go over the course of three years. And then it kind of snowballed as I gained more momentum. Um, and, uh, and it wasn't until like, do you, re do you remember grid? Yes. I was actually going to, that was one of my questions of you doing the grid league too, but I, you went to victory grip. So I was just like, all right, we'll just, we'll just stick to that. But yeah. yeah so, so grid, so grid came along. And for those who don't know what grid is, um, it was actually started by Tony Buddy, who was the former media director. Um, I believe that's what his name it was like, basically him, Castro and Glassman were the faces of the company. And if you go back to the early days, like around in the 2009s, 10s or whatever, it was Tony Budding on YouTube announcing the workouts for the open. Um, he even he he spun off of them and started this spectator sport called grid. Cool concept. Then, you know, that's a totally different story. But anyway, it, um, they had this huge combine of, uh, in, uh, of around the country, um, and they need every team needed a forty plus or masters athlete, and you could specialize. And I filled the, both those roles, being a gymnast and being over four, around forty. Um, and I ended up making the New York Rhinos. Um, and on the first year and on the rhinos, I was on a team with Matt Frazier, Annie Thor's daughter, Easy Muhammad, Chelsea Hughes. Um, and, and then, um, and then I rode the pine behind Ron Matthews, master's athlete. Um, and then the next season I got picked up by the Phoenix rise mm -hmm. where I was on a team with Marcus Philly, Bjork Odin's daughter, Amanda Goodman, um, Blaine McConnell, who's now uh, an Olympian in the uh, bobsledding. Um, and so that allowed me to take my specialties and just, and also my age, and allowed me to be around these 
games athletes. Yeah. And now the venue to be in something that I wouldn't have in any other normal cir- CrossFit circumstance been able to do. Mm-hmm. Um, and I did it with it back in my mind. Well, one, I wanted to compete and I thought this was a fun opportunity. It'd be a cool, you know, cool story. But also in the back of my mind, it's like, this is a great way to test the grips. Yeah. And so because of that experience, like, you know, Annie uses our grips and four star still uses our grips. Um, and Marcus is one of our athletes, um, long time, you know, like we have a cool partnership with Marcus. Um, easy is, uh, you know, easy Muhammad. He's still a good friend and we work together on various projects. Um, so that kind of really made things take off what, but what really made the grips take off and it was just really serendipitous because my grips sweep around the pinky side of the hand for yeah. false grip protection. So in 2016, um, uh, Castro announced that they're going to have strict, strict muscle ups in the, uh, in the, um, in the regionals. Yep. That couldn't have been a better situation because that's what's one of the aspects that makes our grips unique. We have eight patents on our grips and, but that was one of the aspects of it. And, um, I, Emily Bridgers, who was competing at the time, um, multi-time games athlete lived in Atlanta and I knew her from the Atlanta CrossFit scene. Mm -hmm. And I texted her and I was like, Emily, I know you don't wear grips. Um, but I got, you know, I, I saw your post, she posted her wrists were all jacked up from strict muscle up work. And I'm like, I'm coming over to your gym, check these out. And she was a gym dog. She was a, um, you know, Georgia Bulldog gymnast. Yeah, exactly. And she didn't wear grips because there was nothing out there that she liked Mm -hmm. that. And then she put my grips on. She goes, Oh, wow. You know, these actually feel like my gymnastics grips. And I was like, exactly. So, (laughs) you know, she's just a gracious, awesome person. I love her to death. And she posted, and once she posted, that made me realize the power of social media. Boom, it took off. I was like, holy shit. <laughs> um, and, and, and we were just like, my wife and I were like, holy cow. <laughs> we just did $1,000 in sales in one day. And, you know, and, so, um, and, and so that really kind of between Grid, Emily, all these interesting serendipitous aspects you know, that's when it really helped us get onto the scene. Mm-hmm. Very cool. Yeah. And so I know, I, I think, I, to be honest with you, I think your victory grips are like one of the top, you know, are the top grips in the market. Cause I've, I've tested a lot of them and I've tested victory grips and I, I, I like them. It's so, I mean, I'm a big fan of them, even though I, you know, I'm right now I'm wearing bare complex ones. So, but don't, 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 don't hate me. So, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so so do you, I know you said you were talking about like something in your pipeline. So can you talk about it at all or do you want to hold off on that? Well, yeah, I could I could allude to it. I, um, it's a new material. There might be some new design aspects, but you know, it's, to me, it's, um, I'm always pushing it and learning from it. And I'm work, I've been working with a company here in the United States that does materials um and we've just been that like the same same group of people that helped me with our tactical material but we're improving upon that um so it's basically going to be like a new version of the tactical okay but better okay and cool. it's about where all i wear where i want to go with it right yet but i can tell you you know it's going to be higher performing it's going to be more comfortable um, it's going to be more durable. Um, so to me, it's a very important, very important project because, it, you know, my whole aspiration is creating the quintessential grit and it's in design and material. So I just focus on me. Um, even though, why are you wearing bear complex, man? <laughs> What's up with that? I just, I just got off of Amazon to be honest with you. So uh, I mean, yeah. it was there. So yeah, you, don't, you don't sell on Amazon. You know, one of the things is like, um, you, you know, it's a, we, I'm, I want to be like the Ferrari of grips, not necessarily yeah. the most sold, but the most sought after. Um, and 
that's what I do. We don't sell on Amazon for various reasons. And a lot of it has to do with controlling our brand and our education. I'm big on education. Um, and so I'm just like, it's, I, to me, it's just not something I just want to throw out there and that people will rip really easily and all that. Like I have, um, I, I have a lot of big standards when it comes to the grips and how they are, you know, perform and the longevity of them. And I'm constantly, you know, learning from it. You know, I do, you know, I don't necessarily ever care what competitors are doing. It's kind of like trying to do a workout and you're always kind of looking at competition instead of focusing on yourself. Yeah. Um, but that doesn't mean, mean I don't test their grips, you, you know, for, for flaws or for, you know, where, you know, strengths or what have you. I have a whole cool, interesting guillotine test that I haven't displayed yet where I could literally mimic, I could literally mimic how a grip is going to rip like in what fat and what way, where the rip is going to occur, how it's going to occur and how fast it's going to occur. Um, and it's, I call it the guillotine test. And okay. I could, it's basically a clamp a grip to, <laughs> to a pull up bar. Um, and, and then the, and <laughs> I probably shouldn't be saying all this. So, <laughs> so, the, <laughs> so the grip is clamped to the pull up bar um the wrist portion is clamped to a dumbbell the dumbbell is clamped to a kettlebell a chain and a kettlebell and i drop it <laughs> there's a lot to it but it is incredibly accurate so i can i i test my my grips for how they're gonna rip it's like a crash test dummy and i compare that to how other p other companies grips rip and i know exactly where their flaws are at mm -hmm. and so if my grips are not beating them i'm not going to like release a certain design or a certain material like whatever i'm going to put in there has got to make sure it exceeds the strength and durability and, and durability in that test alone um compared to to other competitors it's kind of just kind of like kind of it's like a benchmark for me okay all right that's cool. how i pay attention to the competitors and and then just kind of seeing what materials they're doing and they're like yeah no still don't got me <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, well I, I have, I have. There's one that I have that I was testing out, just trying out. Not victory. It was something else. We'll talk after about it. But uh, all right, cool. So we're getting close to the end. So um, just a couple, like you know, fire questions at you. So do you have any other goal? I know you said you have like a new, new, you know, grip coming out. So do you have any other goals that you have, like personal or business wise? Uh, we're starting in a CrossFit affiliate, yeah. Victory Gym in Savannah. Um, and then that's, uh, it's victory gym. The CrossFit name is going to be CrossFit y'all <laughs> because we're in Savannah. <laughs> that's awesome. That is so cool. <laughs> yeah. So that's hopefully opening up May or June of uh, this year. Okay. How, how big is it going to be? Uh, the, it's a 7,000 square foot building, you know, okay. so, you know, we're in, in construction right now. It's in downtown Savannah. Um, and we're also going to be a chapter of of easy muhammad's uh, project onyx okay. so we're gonna be working with uh, um uh kids of of color um in the in the in the savannah area empowering them through fitness um so i'm super excited about that it's something that's very dear to my heart um so yeah the gym project onyx that's the two business goals right now okay very cool so do you have a favorite book you like to read or give out as a gift to people. Oh, that yeah. Um, Meditations of Marcus Aurelius. Okay. Um, yeah, or obstacle is uh, um, obstacle is the way is another one. Um, yeah. Oh, another business goal we got coming up is uh, we're starting Victory Gymnastics. Oh, very cool. So is it is it kind of like a like I'm not trying to like is it kind of like Power Monkey? No, we're gonna be we're gonna be designing grips for. We're going to be designing grips for the actual sport of gymnastics. Oh, very cool. Awesome. Teaming up with, I got a buddy of mine who's an Olympian and uh, we're, we're, we're very close. We're hoping to launch that in Q3. Okay. So hopefully I'm going to be the first uh, grip company that is in both the Olympics on the gymnastics Olympic stage and then on the CrossFit game side. Oh, very cool. That's awesome. 
Yeah, yeah. it's really cool. Okay. So um, what would you tell somebody that's trying to get into the grip space? Like what, to, or even like making a product or like something, what to expect throughout the whole, you know, life cycle of it? Uh, well, I wouldn't say necessarily, you know, be so narrow on if somebody's trying to get into the grip space, as opposed to it's better to ask, you know, if somebody's got an idea, no matter whether it's a idea that has to deal with fitness or any other type of idea is to just do it. Action is the, what you got to focus on mm -hmm. and, and just be tenacious at it. Keep at it no matter what and and enjoy it for the love of just creativity if it something comes of it it comes of it don't look at it i never looked at the grip company and being like this is going to be the way i support my family mm -hmm. you know i never looked at it that way i looked at it like this is a fun idea this is pretty cool you know i'm get to do this and oh wow you know i'm starting to you know it snowballs from there and you get those small small victories but uh do it just for the love of it but stick with it if you like it enough just keep on playing with it you know come back to it go back and forth but just don't give up on it yeah very cool okay so um let's just say you know you're on like you know your last day of life in the world and you know you know you have people talking to you and one of the questions they ask is how do you want people to recognize you after you leave I would say that it's kind of like, it kind of alludes to how I have all this, like this, almost this little eclectic life of doing all these various different things. And I, I hope that somebody could look at my story and be like, this is, you know, I don't have to be, you don't have to be pigeonholed yeah. into any one particular identity and you can change your identity or your life or your what you do on a you know as you see fit if mm -hmm. it's a story life is this evolving story and and it doesn't have to be and it's not linear so i think if you know if you know if somebody looked back at my life and be like yeah i'm gonna do that just because i can mm -hmm. and so hopefully i could be an, an inspiration in that aspect yeah very cool very cool i i'm a big fan of screw it just do it so there's a book by richard branson called screw it just do it and so uh -huh. that's pretty much how i started you know type one lifting i was like holding it back and i'm like oh maybe i'm not ready to start it up yet and then i'm like you know what, screw it just put a couple shirts out and people buy it if they don't whatever just just do I, it i don't know why i never heard of that you know because i, I you know you know he's he's a great entrepreneur and, and an inspiration to me but absolutely 100% right screw it just do it I mean it's like you just if you don't like your job just fucking quit yeah something else <laughs> yeah you know if you know one thing I've always said if I retire like if if I ever do want to do anything else it's like I love working in the yard and then it's like I'm gonna go work for a damn landscape company Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> you know i'm not afraid of heights i'll go work to an electric company and climb poles and make pretty good money yeah um but, but yeah screw it just do it it's just part of a story i like yeah life is a story it, it, and and if you're bored write a new chapter exactly yeah <laughs> totally agree totally agree your Very kids cool. will love it love you for it <laughs> yeah exactly yeah just like you can tell your grandkids be like look this is, i did this 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 and this and then they're like wow this is amazing and then tell all their friends pretty much. Yeah. Very cool. Well, I want to thank you very much for coming on and just talking about, you know, your, you know, awesome, you know, your adventure through life and actually making it to victory grips and being like the top, like the echelon of grips in the CrossFit space. So I th thank you for your time. I do appreciate it. Yeah. It's great talking to you. Thanks for the opportunity. All right. Thank you.